Good morning. Uh, welcome to this Sports Philanthropy webinar. We're very excited today to have with us Danielle Berman, and Danielle's going to talk about creating strategic partnerships with athletes. And, and before we get going, I want to have a chance to welcome everybody on on behalf of the Sports Philanthropy Network, on, on behalf of, of me and, and Kayla and, and others that are involved. Um, we've got a lot of uh, good sessions coming up this week and over the next few weeks and still encourage everybody to make sure that they give us additional topics that are interested. Uh, I know Vinay is on the call and thanks to Upmetrics, we're able to uh, send out some surveys that are going out to make sure we can see what topics people are interested in and what uh, what the feedback has been. So that that's very helpful for us. Uh, we encourage you to continue to participate in the webinars as well as uh, we've got podcasts coming out three times a week. Uh, we're trying to create additional content and connection for people with everything that's going on. We've got a special page that's been created with COVID-19 sports resources. So a lot of different programs and webinars and other things going on. If you have other things you'd like to see us add to that, I encourage you to, to get us that information um, as well. Uh, our weekly newsstand will be out uh, a little bit later this morning, and that'll have a couple big announcements. One is our, uh, our uh, fiscal sponsorship with Players Philanthropy Fund, which allows us now to operate as a nonprofit and, and raise funds, and that'll make it easier to partner with a lot of the organizations in the network and make sure that we can help support your activities and, and get funding to do that. Um, we're also launching, uh, it'll be live either later today or tomorrow morning, uh, an NFL Draft Challenge, NFL Draft Charity Challenge, which is designed to create some fun around the NFL Draft with a group called uh, Rivals Media out of Arizona. And the, the goal there is basically you go on and pick uh, pick the selections. There's some little contests and choices on whether a team's going to trade a pick, keep a pick, go offense, defense, all kinds of different things. And you get sort of virtual money to, to play, no cost to, to enter. Um, hopefully that'll be a way to, uh, to raise some funds for different organizations that need support for COVID relief. Um, but it should be a fun opportunity to engage. And I think the, the draft will be nice because it'll be the first sort of live type of sports event that's gone on really in in about six weeks by the time it gets here on Thursday. Um, I also encourage you uh, to follow. You can see obviously everything that goes on for our social media accounts on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, um, and continue to add content there, make it easy to find what we're doing and, and who we're connecting with. So before we get started, I thought it would be great to go around and introduce everybody, have a chance to introduce themselves and, and their organization briefly, and then um, we'll turn it over to Danielle. So I'm going to, I'll just call on people. We'll start with Kayla, let her introduce her role with the Sports Philanthropy Network. Morning, everybody. My name is Kayla Bradham. I live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and I'm the Vice President of Community Development. So I'm going to ask you guys a favor, if you don't mind, if you're willing to turn your screen so that I can see you, it's a blessing to me to get to know you. I know for some of you guys that's not possible, but if it is, thank you so much. Doug? Uh, good morning. Happy Monday. My name is Doug Garner. I'm uh, Adapted Sports Director at University of Texas at Arlington. Great. Mary? Hi, I'm Mary Littman. I live outside of Atlanta and I am the founder and executive director of House Foundation, which helps kids in our community play sports they love. Fantastic. Um, Michelle, are you between bites? Can we get you on for a minute? Sure, hold on. I'll come back. Hi. <laughs> Sorry, I'm eating my breakfast, everyone. Hi, I'm Michelle Stroud. I'm the Director of Development for Dare to Try. Um, I'm currently at my home in Evanston, just north of Chicago. Uh, we're a nonprofit that works with athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairments, um, so adaptive sports as well, just like so. Great. Uh, Evan? 
Hey guys, how's it going? I'm uh, Evan. I'm the manager for ticket sales and ticket operations with the New York Liberty. So um, for us, this is a pretty, interest, a pretty interesting topic as we uh, start to learn a little bit more about the sports industry. Terrific. Thanks for being here. Jelena? Hi guys, um, this is Jelena. I also work for the New York Liberty. I'm an account executive um, alongside with Evan's team. Thanks for being here, Erica. Hi everyone, this is Erica. I'm outside of Chicago and we teach uh, with Aerostar, underprivileged youth. We teach them aviation, maintenance, and flying. And we do have a couple of pilots, but we'd like to collaborate to see how we can um, get our students more involved. Thank you. Christian? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good. Um, I am part of a charity called Coaches Across Continents, and we use sport or purposeful play, and our main sport is soccer or football, around the globe to teach um, any local community's social mission. Great. Uh, Heidi, can you jump on a minute? It could get loud, folks. I'm, I'm uh, behind the scenes today. I'm getting solar panels installed. I'm with Green Kite Fundraising here in the Washington metropolitan area. Glad to be here. Thanks. Darren? Just introductions? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, Darren Sudman. I co-founded an organization called Simon's Heart. We seek to prevent sudden cardiac arrest and death in children, Great. particularly student athletes. And uh, Darren is going to be one of our featured presenters on Wednesday on the topic of how to run uh, the importance of heart screenings for youth athletes and, and how to set up screening programs for, for that issue. So I encourage you and, and all of your uh, sports organizations to come in and participate in that. Um, so uh, if anybody else jumps on, we'll, uh, did I miss anybody? Let's see who uh oh we did have a few more people jump on the back here so sorry about that uh brandon hello i'm a student and board member of boys for right track a program that teaches life and leadership skills to elementary school students great thanks for being here um okay how about josh No, Josh is on uh, on hold. Uh, Jen, we've got two Jens. Can we get one of the Jens? No. Okay. On mute, Jessica. Hi, my name is Jessica. I'm currently a third year student in Toronto, Canada, and my goal is to get into the sports industry. So I'm just looking to educate myself in the sports industry. Great. Thanks for being here, uh, Shanna. Hi everyone, my name is Shauna. Um, I'm an account executive for the New York Liberty. Terrific, thanks for, thanks for being here. Um, let's see, did we get everybody? I think that, oh, Liz, okay, Liz, I see with the, uh, the background there, thanks I'm for terrible. coming. I'm terrible, I'm doing like the Zoom party foul by having two really bright lights behind me, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm Liz, I'm from an organization called Positive Tracks, I'm the program director and we help young people between the ages of 12 and 25 who are using physical activity of any kind um, to raise awareness about causes, educate people about something that they care about, and sometimes fundraise. And we teach youth how to do that. And uh, we call it sweating for good. We're based in New Hampshire, but also have an office in Boston and Western Mass. Fantastic. Thanks for, thanks for being with us. So um, we'll see if, uh, if uh, we, we get Jen or, or Josh available at some point, we'll, we'll ask them to jump in and introduce themselves. But um, before we, uh, you know, I think at this point, we'll, we'll turn it over to Danielle. Danielle Berman um, has been working in the sports and sports philanthropy space for many years. Um, she puts together a lot of terrific events and conferences at uh, major sporting events like the Super Bowl, the Final Four, which unfortunately she didn't get to do this year, other, although it was a great virtual summit. Um, but Danielle does a lot of work uh, with athletes and, and helping organizations really 
make the connections to athletes and forge the relationships that allow them to build a strong connection. Um, and you'll hear her talk about how to do that and, and the elements of authenticity and other things that are really important to that process. So, um, Danielle, I'm going to go flip this over so you can uh, share your screen and, and be ready to, uh, to, put that, uh, to put that up here. So um, whenever you're ready, it should be all set for you. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Roy. Thanks for the opportunity to come and chat. It's good to see some people um, on like Vinay and Heidi and Kayla. It's good to see you guys. For those of you who have not met me before, I'm Danielle Berman. I'm the founder of Tackle What's Next. Um, and we also do some philanthropy consulting, which we brand as Tackle What Matters. And I do a lot of work with athletes at a high level, college professional, um, and helping them find opportunities outside of sport, um, from philanthropy to job opportunities and start starting their own businesses. Um, but really started out, as Roy said, as a philanthropy consultant. That's what's really near and dear to my heart. And that's why uh, we're here today. So I will go ahead and share my screen here um, with the PowerPoint. Um, and I don't know um, if you guys uh, would like to use the chat or raise your hand, but if you do have questions throughout this kind of talk, I would love this to be a conversation. So please flag me or even just kind of jump off mute and say, hey, I have a question about that because I don't just want to talk you guys through this presentation. I'd love to interact. So any questions that come up, just let me know um, and we'll go ahead and get going. So today was really about creating impactful partnerships with athletes. Obviously right now um, we're in a really strange time, but this is something that can really benefit you throughout the year, throughout some of the programs and campaigns that you guys are doing. Everybody wants to work with high level athletes. They have great visibility um, and it's really important to understand the right ways to go about doing that. So um, why athletes? I think everyone on the call understands the power that athletes have. They have unique following an audience, uh, desire to give back, but also an expectation. We've all seen some of the negative stories coming out about athletes maybe not doing enough during this time or doing things in what people could, would consider uh, not the best ways. Um, so there's definitely an expectation. So athletes are gonna give back, whether they're giving back with your organization or somewhere else or on their own. Um, and obviously they're great allies in promoting your message. If you're working with young people, especially, they're a really great mouthpiece, but really just a good platform to be um, communicating through. Um, just some quick numbers here um, that really show how accessible athletes are to just the general population. Um, they've got a 3% engagement rate, 3.6 I believe it is, which means people are not only watching what they're doing, they're also sharing, posting, clicking, talking to other people about it, um, which is a lot higher than media organizations and companies. So it might be a really unique way to target and align your nonprofit with an athlete versus a big company, um, just for the kind of social benefit of it. Um, obviously, they've got a lot of access to fans. Um, and I put a little stat at the bottom here that says 46% of fans say that following a team or an athlete on social media is important to do as a fan. Um, so you're already getting a lot of buy-in from that local fan community just for the fact that that athlete plays for that team. Um, so I like to call these kinds of um, connections athlete ambassador relationships and programs just simply because it can mean a lot of different things depending on what your organization is about and what you guys are looking to do. Um, so athletes have this platform to raise really valuable awareness about your cause or campaign. Um, they can also open additional opportunities for funding, not necessarily from them donating, but from corporate sponsors of theirs donating, from connections in the uh, sports world, their teammates, things like that. So there's a lot of additional fundraising opportunities that can come from aligning with an athlete. Um, also, as I mentioned, athletes have this really great buzz and platform. Media also talks about them a lot. Um, so you'll find that even a backup professional athlete will get a buzz about doing some charity work um, because people will click on that link and the media wants that buzz as well. Um, so you get a lot of earned coverage, um, free marketing publicity if you work with athletes. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you guys have tried to get athletes to come out and appear at events and initiatives. Having athlete ambassadors is a great way to guarantee a presence of an athlete um, without having to do something like paying for them or negotiating with an agent. Um, it's something that you can build into a partnership that you have um, to make sure that they're available to come out to, let's say, your big fundraisers or a big volunteer day um, to raise buzz for what you guys are doing. 
Um, okay, so today we're gonna kind of go through how to do this. I think everybody on the call is pretty well aware that athletes are really valuable to work with and they have a lot of star power. Um, and again, we're talking college and professional. Um, I think a lot of people go, oh, I want the big superstar from the Bears or the Ravens or whatever, um, but really think creatively about what does the local um, you know, MLS team, what, what kind of athletes are there? What kind of athletes are playing in your big college teams? Because not only do they have more time, they're also not getting hit up as much. So I just wanna make sure everybody's aware that from the get go, we're not just talking about the star quarterbacks or the, or the, or the big basketball players on, in the NBA. We're talking about professional and collegiate athletes in many different sports. And it's important to remember that there are a lot of athletes out there um, and they might not just be those big NBA, NFL, NHL stars. Um, so, and I'm, um, Roy, if you can just do me a favor, because I have my screen shared, I can't really see if there are questions. So if you can do me a favor and just let me know if there are chatted questions, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. And we encourage people to put questions up along the way. Um, I think this topic definitely lends itself to interacting as we go through the conversation. You don't need to necessarily wait until the end. So feel free to put them in the chat and, and I'll jump in for Danielle. Awesome. All right, cool. So I laid out eight steps that are really helpful in terms of engaging an athlete partner successfully. Um, you can see that the first couple are really about your organization um, and understanding your organization. So I'll jump into the first one. Um, just going in with the goal of I want to work with an athlete or I want our organization to align with an athlete is not really going to get you a really strong partnership. You need to go into thinking about working with an athlete, understanding where you need to go, where you need to go as an organization. So if you don't know what your goal is as an organization, you're not going to be able to find that athlete partner that can help you get there. You need that roadmap. So I listed a couple options. Are you trying to get more individual donors? Do you need more participation in a program? Do you need more corporate sponsors? Do you need a dig uh, digital footprint boost? These are all things that you guys might have as goals for your organization. A different athlete might work in some of those different areas. So you need to be strategic about what is the goal that we're trying to accomplish so that you can figure out how do we plug in an athlete here? Do we find you know, an athlete that might be really, really involved and want to volunteer but doesn't have the social media platform? If you're trying to increase your digital footprint, that's not gonna be the best move. So you need to be strategic about who's the right person um, and what is your goal so that when you're going out and reaching out to these athletes, it's very clear how you want their help. Um, and then also be able to communicate your brand. Um, athletes are busy, even those athletes that might not be playing in the NBA, NHL, NFL, they're still being constantly bombarded with opportunities. So these are very, very in-demand people and you need to stand out. You're trying to convince a really busy person that they should work with you. So you need to know who you are and have the compelling message to those athletes to say, hey, this is why we wanna work with you. This is what we're trying to achieve. Let's hop on a call and chat about how you can help us make this happen. So I think it's really important to understand not only what your goals are, but who you are and what your brand is, because it's important to align that with athletes um, that you're looking at. Um, and this slide I think is one of the most important parts. This is where I see a lot of nonprofits go wrong when they work with athletes, is that they're willing to just take any athlete that's willing to work with them in any capacity and, and sign them on. Um, there are such things as the wrong athlete partners and, and the wrong athlete partners we see all the time as the person that shows up to an event and just kind of shakes hands and does the bare minimum and, and, and walks out and, and kind of you never hear from them again or you only hear from them when they're looking for another appearance. Um, these, these kinds of things, you know, the athlete, it's not necessarily a bad thing. They can really help, but it's not something that's going to turn into a long-term strategic partner. You want to look for athletes that actually care about the cause that you work with and work for. You don't want to just find any athlete that's free on a Friday night when you're doing your charity gala and have them show up and, and just for the hell of it. You really want to make sure that athlete is super interested in your cause and fits with your brand. If you guys, I put a couple examples down here. Um, if an athlete has a massive shoe collection, is passionate about shoes, so working with an organization like Tom's where they give away shoes or an organization that's focused on shoes would be a great fit because it's something they already care about and they're already talking about. Um, especially now, a relevant example is 
a food bank or a hunger charity for an athlete that posts a lot about food or cooks a lot and shows that on their social media. It's a really, really engaging and authentic way to loop them in because not only are they going to care about it because it's a cause that matters to them, they're, they love food, they're posting about food, but also their audience that's following them on social media, it won't seem out of the blue. It will seem very in line with what they're doing and, oh, wow, this person's cooking every night and now they're donating to the food bank or they're asking me to donate. That makes total sense. I want to help him or I want to help her. So authenticity is really key. I know we use authenticity a ton and it's such an overused word, but really thinking about Will supporting your brand align with that athlete? I think that's really, really important. What's that athlete's brand? Does it align with yours? And, and will they find a benefit working with you because it fits their brand too? So I think it's really important to think about who are the right athletes to work with and who are the wrong. There might be a list of athletes you already know they're not gonna work, so let's avoid them. Um, and I put at the end, Make sure you have a database, Make tra start tracking this. This should be an official, official way to communicate with each other and create a list of those athletes that might be really good partners. Um, they don't have to be local. Um, that's one thing that a lot of people think, oh, I have to find an athlete that plays in my city. You don't. Um, it could be an athlete that's from that area or just, again, simply has a passion for that cause and wants to get involved. Um, obviously, local is a lot easier just because you can meet in person. They can come out to your events and opportunities more often, but don't limit it to just local athletes. Definitely look around and see who might be a good partner that might live across the country or might live in a different time zone that can support digitally or come out when it makes sense. So Danielle, one of the questions that we have in the chat here is, is looking at how do you get to know the athlete, right? So you, you can look at sort of what's out there publicly, um, but it's probably fairly challenging to get an opportunity to really engage with the athlete individually in the sense of, hey, I want to screen this athlete or interview them to see if there's really a good fit. So what, what for you is the best way for an organization to look at determining um, other than their social media accounts or their typical media interviews to see if that athlete might be a good connection? Yeah, I mean, I think on my next slide, uh, or uh, later in this in the slideshow, I talk about social media. It's a really great way to find out um, from a very basic perspective what they're talking about, what they're interested in, and what they're doing in their spare time. Um, we see a lot more athletes posting about their downtime now, um, especially, but just in general. Um, people will find out what an athlete's doing on their off-season on Twitter or Instagram. Um, I think just really doing your research is very important. Um, looking at articles, following, um, you know, looking and finding, starting Google alerts for athletes that support X, my cause. Looking up that kind of information, it's surprising how many articles are being written or things that are being shared about athletes, whether it's social media or in your local paper or just you know, news that's traveled, I would say definitely do your research. You want to go, you want to go deeper than just like a quick Google search. You really want to look into and really search for athletes that are passionate about this cause. And if you have people that work in sports, um, if you're not necessarily in the sports industry, reach out to those connections because guaranteed some of those executives at different teams, some of those agents in your network have an idea of what their athletes are interested in or what athletes in, in their world and circles are interested in. Um, again, a lot of athletes have multiple passions outside of sport. And so be sure to use those connections um, and not just rely on the internet to tell you what the athletes are doing, but reach out to those contacts that you have in your sports circles, because it's, it's probably something that they can easily ascertain just by, you know, their relationship with that athlete or their knowledge of that athlete and what they're doing. Um, so yeah, it, it's definitely not something that's super easy, um, but it does take, it takes time, but, you know, paying attention and, and, and looking at what the athletes are doing outside of the games that they're playing is really important um, and something that's, you know, definitely worth following them on social media to keep up with them, but then also creating some Google alerts, really talking to people and creating conversations, putting that need out there. You know, a lot of times if you just say, hey, we're looking for an athlete ambassador. So if you know somebody that's really passionate about X, let us know. Putting some of those kind of feelers out there can actually make a big difference. Hopefully that helped whoever asked that question. Um, 
so I kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, you create a target list of athletes, but you know, it, it takes a lot of time, like Roy said, to vet these athletes and figure out what their brands are. And sometimes you might have to talk to that athlete and their team first to find out you know, if that's really going to be a fit. Like I said, it's hard to do um, until you get to know them a little bit more. And, and sometimes it's, it's really, you have to hop on that call and find out if it's going to work out. Um, I would say one of the best uh, pieces of advice that I was given when I started working in sports is you're never going to want to just cold call an athlete. They're first of all, never going to answer. Second of all, never going to respond. And it, that's just not the way that they're minds work. They don't get the calls to get to work. Their agents or their PR reps or even their foundation directors are the people to, to talk to. These are your target contacts. Um, and you want to make sure that when you reach out to them, you have a short and sweet message ready to go. You're not giving them your full plan in this email or in this first phone call. You're just asking them, hey, we are from XYZ organization. We love what John Smith is doing in the community. We love his passion for this. We'd love to talk about potential partnership opportunities. That's it. That's all you have to say. You want to tie in the, the brand alignment, right? But you don't want to give them, we'd love to have him do all these things because they're going to go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is too much. So keep it short and sweet. Keep it simple to the point. But again, make sure you know that this is not the athlete. You're not DMing the athlete on Instagram going, hey, I'd love to work with you. This is a great relationship. You're probably not gonna see a lot of return on that. But if you find that agent or that PR person, they're, this is their job is to field these inquiries. And so if it makes sense for that athlete, they're gonna respond because this is their job to bring on opportunities for them. Um, so that would be the point of contact to go to. And I would jump in and, and add to what Danielle's saying, which is, you definitely don't want to be reaching out for the first time when you want them to come and do something for you. If this is an athlete that you believe is a good fit and you've done some research and you're in the process of reaching out to their media team, to their agents, you should take some time to build a relationship with that athlete. And, and you might not have a direct line to them, but with social media, you can like what they're posting. You can retweet what they, what they tweet. You can go and interact and make comments with them. Um, they do look at it. Now, they may not see it, but you want to make sure that the first time that they hear your name or your organization's name is not when they get the call from, from that agent and they, the agent says, hey, uh, Danielle Berman is interested in talking to you. You want them to know that by the time that happens, they've seen Danielle's name 30 times on social media in, in some of the different platforms. And maybe you've even asked them a question or, or tagged them in, in a post so that by the time you get to that request, it's not just an unknown commodity out of the blue. Yeah, that, that's a great point. I think that goes for any partnerships, as you guys probably know, you, you, it's got to be a relationship. And that's really where you get the best return on what you're doing. Um, and so it is important not to reach out, you know, let's say an athlete's had a great season and, and you're like, wow, I'd love to capture some of that attention. We have a big event coming up next month. Let's see if they want to come. That's not the time to start reaching out. The time is starting to reach out is when you guys are just trying to put those plans together. It could be a year out from an event. It could be a year out from a campaign. It could be months out from a campaign, but creating that relationship is way more important. And it might start small. We're going to go into some of the things you can have athletes help out with. You might not get immediate buy-in where they're like, absolutely, I'm in. I want to help with everything. Let me know. They might say, hey, I only want to start like, I'm happy to help, but I can only do this right now. And that's okay. Like, you have to start somewhere, build that relationship up over time. And I think it's important, like Roy said, to make sure you're not waiting till the week of your event to reach out and say, hey, we'd love you to show up because it's probably not going to work out that way. Um, so again, to find these agents PR contacts, a lot of athletes have them in their bios on social media. So that's always a great place to look. Um, again, if the athlete has a foundation that aligns with yours, a lot of times they're looking for opportunities to get involved. So that could be a really great uh, partnership or relationship to build. Um, and sometimes you just have to Google that athlete and said, say who represents them or who's their agent, and you can find some information that way. So definitely want to make sure you have those correct point of contacts and you're reaching out, you know, in a, in a timely way. 
Um, I mentioned um, kind of when you reach out, and Roy mentioned this too, it's really hard to get an athlete's attention during the season. Um, they have really busy schedules. They've got a lot of um, team, uh, you know, things to take care of and a lot of team programs and partnerships that they're working on. Um, and, and especially never reach out on game day or after a loss. Um, I have been in organizations where this has happened and it has turned off the athletes so fast um, because instead of focusing on their day to day and their day job, it is pooled focus. And so even their agents and contacts, you probably, first of all, you won't get a, a reply, but it's pretty off putting that on a really busy day for them, you're reaching out for something. So be cognizant if you are working with an athlete that's playing while you're, while you're engaged with them um, and is playing in a, in, a, in a season. When are their games? Did they win last night? Did they lose last night? Um, an important thing is, did they get traded? Did they get cut? Very important to keep an eye on so that you're not reaching out about a big campaign the day after they get cut from a team. Um, it can be really, really uncomfortable. So make sure you know that information and always know that off-season outreach, like Roy said, reaching out to them in advance in their off-season where it might not be super convenient for you in terms in terms of this is a year out, but reaching out in the off season is always going to be more beneficial and you're going to get a much quicker reply than reaching out during a season just because there's so much going on. Um, and I want to build on that as well, because I think that that's a critical point. When the players are in the midst of their season, I, I think that unless you already have an established relationship with them, that is really not a good time for you to sort of start that, that outreach. If you've got some direct connection in there, um, that's one thing. But otherwise, I would really focus those efforts on the off season. And during the season, that's a great time, as we were talking before, to, to give them support or to encourage them about their performance or make comments on the games or let your name come across their feed while they're playing, but not asking them for anything so that they start getting a little bit familiar with seeing your organization and interacting, but not in a, not in a situation where you've got any expectations that they need to respond or that you're adding an extra demand to their schedule. Yeah. And I saw a question about um, like NCAA athletes and how you can work with them. I would say it is a little trickier to work with NCAA athletes simply because they do have a lot of restrictions around benefits and all of those kinds of things. Um, I would say that working with an NCAA athlete typically is more focused on volunteering. Um, and if they have a social media platform, they are absolutely able to promote on social media for a nonprofit. Um, you guys probably saw a couple of, you know, Heisman winning quarterbacks starting some campaigns for COVID relief and, and having it shut down and then reopened again. So I think the NCAA is, is obviously treating these on a case by case basis in terms of obviously the crisis going on now. Um, but like Roy said, the relationship really is key. Um, if you really want to work with a college athlete, again, you're not going to reach out to that college athlete. You're probably going to reach out to that coach or that team, um, that athletic department and say, Hey, we'd love to work with some of your college athletes, specifically these three people. How can we do that? Um, that's really a good way to work with the college athletes because you're going through the proper channel. So you're not reaching out again. It's, it's, you're going to find that athletes are seeing what they're posting on social media, but it's going to be hard for them to respond to you and be like, yeah, I'll call with, I'll have a call with you on Monday. They're probably going to point you to their contact. Oh yeah. Here's my agent's email or here's my agent's phone number. Call them, like talk to them. Um, and same with these college athletes. A lot of them probably aren't going to feel comfortable setting something up unless it's through their school or through a uh, contact at their university or their athletic department that they know will make sure that it's not going to screw up their eligibility, mess up their, um, you know, prospects for the future. Um, but that's a really good question. So definitely go through the university and athletic department when possible, working with NCAA athletes. Um, and I'm, again, I'm going to add there, I think it's critical what Danielle was saying, which is the worst thing that you can do as an organization is to screw up an athlete's eligibility and, and end up in, um, that mess of headlines and everything else that's going on. The restrictions that are out there on NCAA athletes, um, whether we like them or not, and, and they are 
changing and going to be changing substantially over the next few years. But right now, um, there's no possible way that you're going to be able to get through all of the nuances of compliance and everything that they're required. I wouldn't even come close to reaching straight to the athlete. I definitely would not go to the coach. I would go directly to the sports information directors at the schools, um, potentially the compliance, but the SIDs at the schools will typically give you a better response of how you can have access and communication with the athletes. They may need to run things by their compliance department, but you will get virtually no response from the athletes directly, and you definitely won't get response from the coaches um, unless you've got a personal relationship. I'd like to jump in. Sorry, I'm late. This is Lisa Del Pilarati from George Washington University, but actually almost every Division I team now or university has a athlete development and often a, a social, uh, somebody who handles um, community outreach. Mm -hmm. So either their title is community outreach or athlete development. Um, these are the type of people that I believe you should reach out to because they're the ones who will help get the athletes out into the community. And I've been working with a lot of the, um, these community relations or outreach people um, to try to get the students to take real, real positions. Like many of the athletes just go out and start throwing balls. But that's not like they're studying business. They're studying, you know, sociology, have them, or web development, have them actually do accounting for your nonprofit, have them do web development, have them do social media so they get skill sets because most of them can't get full-time internships. So if you have positions in your nonprofit that you need skills, think about working with your local collegiate athletic department. That's great advice. Yeah, no, absolutely. They definitely, like Lisa said, every D1 school likely has that person. And I'm sure D2, D3, some of them have them too, but it's important to make sure that you're going through those proper channels. And like Lisa said, be creative with how you utilize them. It might not be just to come out and be a coach for the day, but if they, yeah, they, they've got great graphic skills, maybe they want to help out with some of your graphic design, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, athletes are doing a lot of different things. Um, so make sure you're being creative. Um, and, and that kind of brings me into my next point, which is be prepared for when you do talk to an athlete and their team and they want to work with you and that they're excited about the opportunities um, because it's really important like Lisa mentioned to have an idea of how you want them to be involved um, so someone asked a question about vetting this is really when vetting happens um, again you want to kind of do your own vetting when you're looking online to find these athletes and, and kind of doing some outreach but when you're on these calls when you're talking to their team you want to find out the first question you should be asking is what are your goals what, as an athlete or as a brand or what is your team trying to do? Is that athlete trying to create off the field or off the court opportunities for himself or herself? Are they trying to grow their online presence? Are they trying to get involved with philanthropy and, and they're really looking to create a long-term relationship that can be beneficial? Um, are they looking for job opportunities outside of sport? Like you just don't know until you have those conversations. So if you're not going in with that mutual benefit in mind of, how can we help you? What are your goals that we can make sure we're both working towards together? Um, that's really important. So these are like basic opportunities, social media engagement, in-person programming and support, PSAs, fundraising campaigns that any athlete would be accustomed to being asked for support. But Lisa brings up a really good point. There's a lot of ways to work with athletes, both collegiate and professional. And so really getting to know that athlete and their team, what do they want to do? What do they like to do? What are their goals? <clears throat> Can really help you come up with a good game plan for that athlete. Um, I would say have some ideas of what you guys need in mind as an organization. It's important to know, here's what we need. Here's what we'd like you to do. Let's try and meet somewhere. Maybe you really need social media support and that athlete is happy to do that, but isn't really about coming to events or coming to volunteer. That's okay, meet somewhere that makes sense. Maybe they wanna come and support one of your board meetings because they're looking for, for opportunities in business outside of sport. 
that's a really great opportunity to number one, have your board get really excited about this cool partnership and get that, get them to know this athlete. But number two, that athletes making connections to help them grow, to help them build relationships and to help them benefit in their future after they put their playing careers over. So think about ways that you might be able to provide value to the athlete. Do you have specific companies on your board? Do you already have corporate sponsors that an athlete might be interested in? Do you have connections in the community that that athlete might benefit from? So just really being creative and really making a, a real list, like really taking stock of what can um, an athlete benefit from on our side. And, and again, you're going to have to ask that athlete and their team what makes sense for them, what do they want, what do they need. Um, so that's really important. Um, again, I kind of mentioned this. Take, take what makes sense. Don't try and force something because you really need somebody to show up to five events a year. That's if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but don't say, okay, well, we can't work with you. Try and find a way that makes sense. If there's a fit and the passion's there and they love your cause, but they can't come to events, try and figure out what makes the most sense for them. Don't just give up on that relationship because you want this to be something that's long-term and can grow. Maybe down the road, they will be able to do that. Um, so it's a two-way street. Make sure you know how it's going to benefit them as well. Um, and, and I think I had mentioned vetting questions. You know, you really want to make sure that you're asking what they have their time to do. Because what you don't want to do is have a knowledge that they're going to be able to commit to X, Y, and Z and be around and on, you know, and around maybe 10 hours a month or whatever their commitment's going to be. And they're not able to do that. You want to make sure that one, they have a passion for it. Two, they have the time. And three, that you guys are all clear on expectations. And that's all stuff that should be confirmed and chatted about before you sign any kind of partnership agreement or before you kind of close the deal to make sure that everybody's on the same page and that everybody's going to be uh, aware of the benefits and what's expected of them going forward. Um, so obviously it, it's really awesome once you get that athlete on board, once you have them coming to events or coming, on, coming online or helping with social media, whatever that ask is that you've had, I think the biggest thing that people miss nowadays is keeping them engaged. Um, a lot of times athletes will either show up to events or, or, or partner with an organization, the big event or the big campaign happens and then it's radio silence for another year until the next thing comes up. And that's really where it becomes a more of a short term gain or benefit, like Roy said, reaching out right when you need somebody and not building that relationship. So it's really important to stay in touch with athletes and their teams, um, their agent, their PR person, and make sure they're on the same page, check in, see how things are going, um, and have, I would say, have a point person in your organization do that. Don't have it be 20 different people. Um, really have that one person, if it's the development director, if it's the partnerships or, or, or um, you know, engagement coordinator, like find that one person that you want to be handling these relationships and make them in charge of, of keeping up those relationships because it's really important. You don't wanna lose momentum. If you have these people on board, you wanna keep them on board. You wanna keep them excited about it. Um, I want to jump in with one other thing here, which. I think is critical to what Danielle's talking about is a lot of people look at the athletes and, and many of the athletes look at themselves the same way, which is, it's very transactional based. It's I'm making an appearance, I'm coming here and I'm going to show up at a fundraising event at a dinner or golf outing, sign autographs, take pictures. And that's really the entire focus of what they believe is their role. You can set yourself apart significantly if you do what Danielle's suggesting here and create truly a partnership and the same as you do with donors for any organization, you wouldn't take a big gift from a donor, a major gift, and then not speak to them or contact them until you ask them again for a gift the following year. And you should deal with athletes the same way, even if they're not making a financial contribution, you want them to become a friend, a friend of your organization, you want to interact with them. And that means sending them texts periodically. That means sending in checkup emails. Um, maybe it doesn't have to be formal. You don't necessarily have to put them on a holiday card list, but send them a text, send them an email. How are you doing? What's going on with this crisis? How do you, how's your family holding up? Because you want them to feel that connection 
and you want to be differentiated from the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other people that are asking them for something, you're offering to be there and be a resource for them and give them something. Yeah, and I, th I think even beyond just checking in with them, but keeping them actively engaged in the work that you're doing, I think is really important. They've decided to partner with you for a reason. They want to help you achieve your goals and your mission, whether it's helping the kids that you're working with or helping the community or whatever, whatever your goals are as an organization. If they're partnering with you, that means they've bought in and they want to help. So again, we're including them in the feedback. I think, sure, shout them out. Be generous with your support. I put in there, like, if an athlete does something really cool in the game, like, hey, you know, great job. He's one of our athlete ambassadors. Or, hey, you know, happy birthday, Sarah. Like, thanks for being an athlete ambassador for our organization. Like, it makes them feel good. They can share that. They can raise awareness just through that. But also um, making them feel like they're a part of the team. So if you guys are having a campaign discussion with your board and with your supporters um, and asking for feedback, include that athlete in their team don't don't leave them out and say okay well here's what everybody in our circle told us would be the best idea so here's what we're going to do go to them with that same feedback hey here's what we're planning on doing do you have any thoughts on this um, do you guys have anything similar that you've done um, you know that might really help or work or be able to benefit this um, just make them feel like a part of the team it's really important it's a really small ask but it's something that keeps them engaged and like Roy said that way you're not randomly reaching out to them to say hey how are things going you're saying hey here's what's coming up for us here's the next kind of steps of what we're doing would love your mm -hmm. feedback here so I think being really intentional about that um, is really great and and that goes right into showing your value there's absolutely no point in working with athletes if you're not going to show the benefits and the awesome work that you guys are doing together um, so again, just like you want to ask the athletes for feedback, you also want to ask your board, your sponsors, your donors, um, people that follow you, do they have ideas on how an athlete partnership could work? Um, I think especially sponsors and board members might have some really creative ways um, to work with athletes that you just might not have thought of. Um, and even donors might be excited to say, hey, we'd love to have this athlete do a shout out to some of our beneficiaries and say thanks so much. Whatever those things are, just thinking about including all of those stakeholders in your organization when it comes to figuring out how that athlete can add value, whoever you're comfortable reaching out to for advice, definitely do that because there's more than one way, as, as Lisa and Roy have pointed out throughout, there's more than one way to do this. It shouldn't be a uniform thing that works the same with every athlete you're working with. And, and it shouldn't be organization to organization the same thing. Every organization should have their own plan of action and per athlete, it should be different. Um, and again, maybe one of your sponsors wants to engage with an athlete um, that can benefit them on the business side. Those are all just things to keep, keep in mind and to, to really, um, you know, take into consideration when you're talking about opportunities. So Danielle, one of the questions we have here is about working with Paralympic athletes and athletes with a disability. So uh, we're actually hosting a town hall uh, session on Friday as our webinar on adaptive sports, and I think that's a great topic to get into. But in, in the work that you're doing, uh, give us a sense of, of what interest and demand there has been for bringing adaptive sports athletes into this realm. Yeah, I think it's really, like I said at the beginning of this presentation, it's really important to think outside of the traditional big four sports. Um, and, and when you're looking for athlete ambassadors, especially those organizations that are working in the area of you know, you know, helping disabled children or helping disabled people get active in sport, um, it's really important to have like-minded and, and role models that understand the experience. So absolutely, these Paralympians, these disabled athletes are looking for opportunities to give back. And they're probably not gonna get a call from the American Red Cross or from the American Cancer Society. They, they're probably looking for those opportunities and it's a really unique opportunity to go and say, we're working with young people that are going through what you may have gone through yourself. Would you be able to be a role model or a mentor? So definitely a lot of opportunities there. I personally haven't worked with uh, an athlete in that capacity, but I know many athletes are doing a lot of things in that community um, and they're definitely eager to do more. They wanna do more. They have these tremendous stories and experiences. Um, an athlete is, is a 
very big word to describe a lot of different types of people. A lot of different people are athletes. Um, and so just again, so getting out of that traditional big four sports um, and really thinking about all the different athletes that are out there, um, there might be some really unique relationships that you're able to build by thinking outside of that, you know, traditional realm and really going after athletes that have gone through what the people that you're working with have gone through and being able to not only serve as an ambassador, but as a role model or a mentor, uh, a volunteer. So I think that's really important and a great question. Um, I personally would love to work with uh, some Paralympic athletes. Um, haven't yet, but, you know, always opportunities, I think, especially for those nonprofits in that realm, um, it's a great and easy connection to get to get them on board and to get them interested at least in that tie-in. So good question. Um, just a little bit more about showing your value. I only have a couple more slides here, but um, a really big important thing is tracking your metrics on athlete supported programs. Um, again, if an athlete does a PSA and you get an influx of donations, let that athlete know, like tell them that they had an impact. I think a lot of times athletes work with organizations, they get the thanks so much for your support, you've helped us so much, but don't actually see the numbers and the data behind it. And it is really powerful. If an athlete knows that simply by recording a one minute video, they helped you raise $1,500 or $10,000, that's really powerful for them to go, oh, okay, I can do another one. This is really, you know, something that's really helping or making an impact. Um, or if, you know, they did a post and you got, you know, 15 times more engagement, let them know, tell them that, show them the numbers, and also make sure you're sharing that with your stakeholders as well. Hey, we have this partnership with this athlete. Because of that, we've raised an extra X, Y, and Z number of, uh, of donors. Individual donors have gone up, engagement's gone up showcase that not only to the athlete but also to your stakeholders whether that's the board sponsors donors etc um, just show your value regularly and show that athlete's value show that they mean something to you that they're contributing that they're making a difference um, and then my last thing is don't be afraid of change this should not be a stagnant program. Um, unfortunately, the life of an athlete at a high level is not uh, very uh, stagnant. Um, they change teams, they change divisions, they change levels of sport, they might retire, they might get cut. They just don't know what necessarily a year from now will look like. Um, so it's important to be flexible and to be willing to change. If your program's not working, if the athlete partnership you've created isn't necessarily giving you the, the best bang for your buck or the best kind of outreach or, or goals that you're trying to accomplish, it's important to, to talk to those people you're working with as well as the athlete to get feedback. Hey, we haven't really seen the boost that we wanted from this. Do you have any ideas, suggestions? Maybe we're not doing this the right way. Um, you know, getting them actively involved in the conversation and asking for their feedback and ideas is really important and lets the athlete know that you wanna work with them to make sure this is successful for both of them. Um, and again, please feel free to change, right, if things aren't working. So I had an organization that I was working with um, that had a, a, a had wanted to get some support because they had had a baseball player who was playing with them for a long time and he got traded across the country. And they lost all the great progress they had made with him showing up to volunteer, to all their events. He had done some massive fundraising campaigns for them and he got traded and you know, they were kind of starting from scratch. And <clears throat> it's really tough because had they been flexible and asked that athlete, hey, is there anyone on your team here locally that you'd recommend we talk to about taking your place? We know you're getting traded. This is not something that happens all the time, but just thinking about creatively from that athlete's perspective, who on your team might be willing to take your place or do you think might be a great person for us to contact? Would you be willing to refer us? Would you be willing to make that connection for us? Um, again, can be a really great thing because athletes do get traded a lot. Athletes do get cut, they retire. Um, a lot of things change and can change pretty quickly. So be creative and be flexible. Understand that an athlete might move out of state um, or out of the country, depending on their situation. And they might not be able to do the support that you were planning on getting from them. They might have to cut down or they might have to change. Um, so I think it's really important to have a backup plan and to have opportunities for them to engage even at a really small level um, and just again be creative and think outside the box in that way um, and, and I think that goes back to one of Danielle's earlier points where you talked about doing things in the off season 
um, having athletes record things for social media. There's a lot that can be done, even if the athlete is not local, because the likelihood is they're not going to be doing um, that many appearances during the season. Um, some sports lend themselves a little more easily to things during the season, but most of them, it's it's a challenge to build that into their schedule. And that that point of a substitute person is really important because that's happened frequently at celebrity golf events or other types of appearances where somebody is slated to be an MC or um, participate in an event and for whatever reason due to illness or family emergency or or whatever the case may be, they can't be there. Um, you'll find that the athletes are typically more than willing to help you identify somebody that can take their place because they understand that that puts you in a bad spot and you've already built that relationship with them. So they want to make sure that they can help you. Yeah. And, and this is the last slide. I know we only have a couple minutes left, but the three things that if you had to take away anything from this today um, is, is to remember that this partnership needs to be authentic. This can't come out of nowhere. This can't be something that really helps you and doesn't help them. Um, it needs to be transparent and authentic to your brand and the athletes should always be mutually beneficial. Um, if not, you're not gonna see it last very long. Um, and again, be creative, do something that's fun, it stands out, it's not just, you know, oh, we're doing this fundraising campaign, um, you know, donate $1,000, but maybe it's some kind of com competition or giveaway or something, trying to be creative. And, and again, um, just like that great question, I, I don't remember who asked it, but don't just think about those athletes that play for the big four pro sports teams. Look at college athletes, look at college teams as volunteers, look at um, Paralympians, Olympians, all these people that are, are trying to make names for themselves that don't have this big team marketing juggernaut that a lot of the big four sports have. They're looking for opportunities just like this. So be creative think outside the box and and definitely feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any questions um i know this is kind of the end of our time but if there's well, any questions and, and we'll, them. we'll we'll have all of this uh the powerpoint and the video will be up on the site later tonight so that'll have all of danielle's contact information um as well as these slides and and uh the video so you'll be able to go back and, and look at that i think one point that's really important from what Danielle mentioned at the end there is the idea of mutual, mutually beneficial. Oftentimes people are looking at it as a one-way street and they recognize what the athlete can do for them. Many organizations really fail to take advantage of what they can do for the athlete. And the way that you can really strengthen that relationship is by tapping into your board of directors, into your sponsors, uh, and that becomes a great resource for the athlete because the athlete is looking for resources when their playing career is done. And if they're doing it well, they're building up their professional reputation and their contact base while they're playing because a lot more people will talk to you while you are a professional athlete than once those doors close. So you really have a lot as an organization to offer them in terms of connecting them to business people in the community. You've got a board of directors, you've got sponsors, you've got donors. Think about what's important to that athlete and, and even better, ask the athlete what's important, what do they wanna do when they're done playing sports and who can you introduce them to while that's going on. I know we're, we're at the end here, so I want to thank everybody for coming. Danielle, before you run, why don't you just give everybody your email address and contact info, and it'll also be up on the page. Yeah. Um, and if you need it, feel free to reach out to me if you, if you don't have it some other way. Yeah, I just dropped it in the chat. It's Danielle at TackleWhat'sNext.com. Thank you all for being here, for tuning in. I hope all of you stay healthy. Um, I saw a couple chat messages I will for sure follow up with uh, before I hop out of here. Um, but thank you guys so much. You can go to TackleWhat'sNext.com and learn more about what we're doing for athletes. Um, but yeah, if you guys have any questions at all, um, please reach out. And thanks again, Roy, for the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, everybody. Great. I appreciate everybody being here. Um, thank you for your time and interest. We will have a survey going out about uh, the webinar, and I hope you will fill that out and also let us know what other topics you're interested in. Wednesday, as I mentioned, uh, Darren Sudman uh, and Sheldon Hill are going to be here talking about heart screenings and the importance of those for athletes and, and how to get a program like that implemented. On Friday, we're hosting a town hall meeting. 
um, and Michelle Stroud is one of the hosts for that. And we're going to be talking about adaptive sports and not only the issues directly impacting the adaptive sports community, but hopefully more importantly, how we can expand the availability of adaptive sports and get that integrated into all kinds of other organizations that currently don't have an adaptive sports program or don't have the bandwidth and, and how we can get those organizations connected to the adaptive sports world. So again, on uh, behalf of the Sports Philanthropy Network, on behalf of Kayla and myself, we appreciate you being here with us today and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinars. Thank you. Thanks, guys.